Good morning and welcome to the first of 2023's uh, quarterly in the fourth breakfast hosted by our beloved Commissioner Steve Bradshaw. I welcome all of you that are here in person and also those of you who are joining online. I am here today uh, filling in for Alicia Brooks from the District 4 team. My name is Upenda Dubose. I am the Director of Corporate and Community Engagement with Big Brothers Big Sisters Metro Atlanta. And I am invited today for a special announcement that you will get more information on later in the uh, presentation from both Commissioner Bradshaw and our CEO Kwame Johnson. A little bit about me, I am a DeKalb resident for more than 20 years. Uh, I have produced uh, two DeKalb County Schools graduates, one from Cedar Grove High School who went on to Alabama A&M University, and one from DeKalb School of the Arts who is at the University of Georgia, and I have a senior at Arabia Mountain High School who this morning could not join me because she is in um, Alabama at the University of Alabama in Birmingham's campus receiving a scholarship. So I just want to say thank you to all of the hard work uh, of the teachers that have been in the lives of my children and the administrators. And then last but not least, in the back is my last DeKalb County Schools student, um, and that is Macy. And she is a sixth grader at DeKalb Elementary School of the Arts. Shout out to Principal Bianca Hamilton and that staff. Again, thank you for all that you do. Uh, so we will move forward with our agenda. Um, a few housekeeping notes. The restrooms are directly outside of this door. I think one is out of order, so you may have to use the one that's further into um, the facility. Uh, but. They have been very accommodating, and we want to also thank those um, who work on the staff of the Toby um, Grant Recreation Center and this beautiful facility this morning. Uh, the food is in the back of the room, so feel free to get your breakfast. It's grab and go. Uh, I want to thank our youth ambassadors um, for serving this morning. Thank you for your service. Uh, just a reminder that Q&A will be at the end of the agenda, so please hold your questions. And again, I want to thank all of those who are attending virtually on YouTube. Okay, so first up, um, we are going to hear from Commissioner Bradshaw, and I just want to um, thank him so much for his partnership with Big Brothers Big Sisters Metro Atlanta. I want to thank him for hosting um, this meeting this morning and for all he does for not only District 4, but DeKalb County. He is in his seventh year as District Commissioner, and he also serves as the chair for the Finance, Audit, and Budget Committees. And so without further Without further ado, we will get opening remarks from Commissioner Steve Bradshaw. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. We can do a little bit better than that, so let's try again. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Much, much better. Thank you all so much for being here this morning, uh, here in person and logging in. Uh, on this Saturday morning, I know everybody has busy lives. There are plenty of other things you could be doing on a Saturday morning, but you're here, and it's a testament to your caring and concern for your community and your civic engagement, and uh, I want to say how much I appreciate that. Uh, I want to thank our special guests who are here this morning. You'll be hearing from all of them shortly. I also want to thank, as always, the representatives from our administration who are here to support us this morning, as they always do. I'm always so grateful for the support of our administration. Uh, you'll be hearing from representatives from police sanitation uh, code enforcement as we move forward. I'll give a special shout out to, to my friends from DCTV, uh, their choices in... <laughs> I 
would say their choices in pro football teams leave a little bit to be desired, but uh, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to hold that against anybody. They do a great job. And, of course, our IT department, who are make, who's making it possible for us to do this both in person and virtually. Uh, and I want to thank our youth commissioners, representatives in the back, young people here out doing public service. Please give them a hand. You know, y'all, it's, it's important that we catch them young. We got to catch them young, and that's one of the things we'll be talking about this morning with big brothers, big sisters. And, of course, I want to always thank my amazing staff who do an outstanding job. I've said this before. I'll say it again, that the citizens of District 4 and De DeKalb County are very fortunate to have these uh, dedicated public servants working on their behalf. Uh, Carrie Cordes, who uh, is our communication specialist. Wave, Carrie, so everybody knows who you are. Robin Fleeg, who y'all met out front, who's our constituent services coordinator. So if you got a question, concern, constituent issue, first call is usually to her. And of course, our leader, Alicia Brooks, who is not with us this morning. She's got a birthday coming up soon, so she's getting ready to head off on a cruise with her family and take a well-deserved break. But uh, I assured her that we will not try not to destroy anything or tear anything up while she's gone. I think we're all in good hands, and it would be impossible for me to discharge the duties of this office without them. And I want to thank Upindi for stepping in. Uh, proficiently, courageously, with talent. I appreciate you answering that call. So at this point, I want to acknowledge the presence of other elected officials uh, and give them a chance to greet you. You know, this this path we've chosen of public service and politics is not always an easy one. Uh, I've got a whole new appreciation for uh, those of us who go down that path. So I definitely want to afford my colleagues in public service the opportunity to address you. So I'll just go by who I see and start with my uh, friend Viola Davis, if you would like to address the, the gathering this morning. I just want to say good morning. I'm Representative Viola Davis, and we'd like you up here to listen to my commissioner, Commissioner Bradshaw. And I thank you for having me to be the breakfast to keep us updated on what's going on. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Representative Davis. Newly uh, elected member of the State House, uh, Representative Omari Crawford. Good morning, everyone. I'm Omari Crawford. As the commissioner said, I'm the newly elected House rep from District 84, which is the Cat County based district. I'm a product of the Cat County, went through the entire Cat County School District, um, entire education, and now currently work with the Cat County Law Department. So this county means a lot to me socially, professionally, personally, and so when the commissioner asked if I'd be here this morning, how do I say no? On top of that, the commissioner's brother was my high school principal. So, <laughs> and, uh, that is so true. He means a lot to me, and so does his brother. So thank you. Good to meet you all. I look forward to working with you. Representative Crawford, I'll make sure my brother knows you gave him a shout out this morning. So he'll be judge, if you would, please. See you in the back, please. Address the gathering here. Yes, good morning, everyone. I want to thank the Commissioner for having me for this opportunity to be here. I'm also honored and excited to be back. It's a community where I spent many of my summers here. My family, you know, my family members were here at Toby Grant, so I'm excited about being here. But I'm also excited about working with the other, other constituents that we see here. The House President, we have um, our president. So it's all about us working together, and I just want to thank you all so much. And again, thank you, Commissioner Bradshaw. I look forward to Outstanding. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you. Are there any other elected officials here that I'm not seeing? 
All right, we'll move on. Also, want to recognize a really good friend of mine. You know, I'm. You know, this is a public meeting, but I'll just say I'm, I'm a man of faith. Both of my grandfathers were pastors, so I want to acknowledge my good friend, Pastor Vandy Simmons from Antioch Amy Church, sir. Is there anything you'd like to say this morning? <laughs> All right. Well, we are glad to have you. All right. And as other folks come in, we want to make sure we acknowledge them, so we'll be on the lookout. So uh, we'll carry on. I will try to be brief so we can hear from my guest, but there are a few things that I will highlight. But before I go through my notes, there's something I want to do, and I'm going to depart from the microphone for a bit. bit. I think my voice projects. Oh, thanks. Outstanding. <laughs> of DeKalb County. And this is something I do in, in all of my community meetings to make a point, okay? This area in blue, that's District 4. That's my district. So I'd make that point. There's such a thing called Central DeKalb. That's where we are, breaking together North and South. That paradigm has not done us any good over the years. It just hasn't. That's Central DeKalb. That's where we are. So I underscore that point for a reason. And I'm glad the map's up here so it's, uh, so it's graphic. So just keep that in mind as we all go forward, discharging the duties of our lives, there is a thing called Central DeKalb County. Has everybody got clarity on what I'm trying to communicate? All right, we'll carry on. I'll give you that back. All right, just a few more points that I'll make. So we're in budget season right now, and uh, the way to, I'll be brief, the way the Cab County's budget, you know, process works is the CEO every year has until December the 15th to present a budget proposal to the Board of Commissioners and to the public. And we, the Board of Commissioners, in turn, have until basically March 1st either to adopt it, reject it, or amend it. And what we usually do is adopt it with some amendments. So we're going through that process now. Uh, as was previously stated, I'm chair of the budget committee this year, so I'm getting a whole new immersion in the numbers that I had not received previously. We have a process that requires a couple of public hearings. We do those down at the Maloof building during our business meetings on a Tuesday morning. But everybody can't be at the Maloof building on a Tuesday morning at 9 o'clock. So this year's budget chair, I've decided to host a series of community meetings around the county so we bring the process to the people. So we had our first one on this past uh, Wednesday evening down in Stonecrest at the Stonecrest Library. And just as a side note, if y'all haven't been in that library, it is a beautiful, beautiful facility. So it was a great meeting. We've got two more coming up, one on February the 8th in Tucker and one on February the 15th in Dunwoody. So we've got North, South, and Central DeKalb covered. Also, we are, as we know, the General Assembly is in session. So as you all met, a couple of our state representatives, and every year we uh, go down to the Capitol pre to present our legislative agenda from the Board of Commissioners to our representatives. In fact, we're scheduled to meet with our delegation on Monday afternoon to formally present the agenda. Uh, and uh, I've got one item on the agenda myself. There are various items to cover various things. But my item is focused on MARTA, the transportation system. MARTA is one of the biggest transportation systems in the entire country and yet receives no dedicated funding from the state of Georgia. Every other major system in major metropolitan cities gets some dedicated funding from the states in which they reside, but not Georgia. 
So my proposed legislation seeks to change that. The state of Georgia should be helping to fund that system. So hopefully one of my colleagues in the General Assembly will take that up and start to push it forward. I don't know if it's going to happen in one throw, one cycle, but it's something I'm going to keep pushing because it's, it's extremely important. A couple other things I'll mention, and then I'll yield back to you, Pendy. Uh, Y'all know we've got our senior and community center on Elam Road in South Hairston under construction. That process is going very, very well. I, we were out there a few weeks ago, so uh, hopefully, and I don't want to be locked into a specific date, but hopefully it'll be completed within the next two or three months. And once that happens, we will have a big ribbon cutting ceremony and it'll be open there for the public to enjoy for the next 25, 30 years. And that's what we call a legacy project. So I'm very excited about that. It's on a great piece of land. It's a great facility. It abuts Hairston Park. We'll build, build a trail system over time to connect the center to the park. It's I couldn't be more pleased with how that's all evolved. So I wanted to give you all a brief update on that. And then the other thing I'll mention is Memorial Drive. The revitalization of that uh, commercial corridor is a top priority of this term of mine in office. This is something we've been working at for a while. I've allocated significant money from my office, uh, various uh, funding sources to keep that rolling. And I'm proud to say this morning that uh, our efforts have uh, garnered attention from other people who are willing to join that cause. Recently, our esteemed United States Congressman Hank Johnson has con allocated $1.5 million for the Gateway Project on Memorial Drive, so we're very grateful to Congressman Johnson. And our United States Senator John Ossoff has recently allocated $840,000 to the Ethiopian Community Center on Memorial Drive. And Senator Ossoff was in the district just a couple weeks ago visiting with the leaders in that community. Representative Davis was there. but. Things are moving forward. You know, people said, you know, it'll take 15, 20 years to turn around Memorial Drive. I don't have 15 or 20 years. I'm going to be on the golf course again in 15, 20 years. We're going to get it done a lot sooner than that. And just to uh, continue that for one second, I don't know if any of y'all lately have driven around the Kensington Marta Station, which is in our district, to see all the development that's going on around there. Five, three, five Five years ago, nothing. All that's been happening since I've been in office. And that's just the beginning. That's all around the station. That doesn't even count the 35 acres that MARTA owns on the site where the parking lot is. There's a master plan study underway now to turn that into transit-oriented development. So three, five years from now, that entire area will be unrecognizable from what it is today. That is forward progress, and it's not going to take 15 to 20 years. So I just want to underscore that point. And I think I'm going to stop right there and let's keep the program rolling. So uh, I'll bring our mistress of ceremonies back up to take us through the rest of the agenda. And thank you all so much for being here and listening. Thank you for those uh, valuable opening remarks, Commissioner. Um, this is the first Q4 meeting of 2023, but just a reminder that we will also be meeting three more times this year in April, July, and October. Okay. Next on our agenda, I am happy to introduce uh, the CEO of Big Brothers, Big Sisters, Metro Atlanta, so my chief and friend uh, for so many of years working uh, in the community to improve outcomes for youth. Uh, his name is Kwame Johnson. Again, he is the president of the agency, president and CEO. He is award-winning. He is an author. Author. Uh, he was recently named to the Titan 100. So um, he is definitely doing great work, again, in the community. But most of all, he truly cares about um, the youth in Metro Atlanta and and I am happy to bring him up at this time to share some information with you.
Thank, thank you, Upenda. Uh, my right hand, I got to give you some money for saying all those nice things about me. Um, but before I get started, I just want to thank uh, Commissioner Bradshaw for bringing us together. Uh, he's been supporting us for a number of years, and there are a lot of different types of leaders, right? Uh, but he's the type of leader that actually does what he says he's going to do and, and steps up. So I just appreciate you, Commissioner Bradshaw, for all the work that you're doing. Let's give him a round of applause for that. And this is an amazing room to be in, right? This is, uh, you know, pretty special. You know, we have a couple of sayings that we say at Big Brothers and Big Sisters, and one is bigger together, right? And I think that's what this, this room represents. We got folks from all walks of life working together to try to help young people get to that next level. Another term we have is called defending potential. Um, and I think we all got here because someone defended our potential. If you got here without mentors, we need to sample your blood because uh, you, are, you are very unique. Uh, this is National Mentoring Month, so we do a lot to talk about mentorship. And what's interesting about the term mentorship, that it does not exist in Latin. It actually doesn't exist in a lot of different languages outside of the U.S., and if you speak with someone who's new to America from, you know, like this pick a Hispanic country, they'll tell you that mentorship means family. So they don't even really need the word. They equate it to family. I'm from upstate New York, a very cold place called Syracuse. And I know there's probably some New Yorkers in the room who don't count Syracuse as part of New York, but I, but I do. I know it's not Brooklyn or Bronx or any of that kind of stuff. And as cold as it is out to the side today, this is how it feels pretty much every day in, in Syracuse where I'm from. But when you come to the South, you hear about this thing called Southern hospitality, right? And you realize that it's a real thing coming from the North. And the best way to describe it, in my opinion, is when you like go to Miami and you get off of a flight and that humidity just hits you in the face. You can't really describe it, but you just know it's there. But what's unique to me about Southern hospitality is that I've been here now eight years in, in Atlanta, and most people I meet are not from here. They're from somewhere else. And they come here, whether you're from New York like me or California or out west, and you adopt this whole Southern hospitality thing. It becomes a part of what you do. So my goal is to make mentorship a part of what we do here in DeKalb, a part of what we do here in Atlanta, because it's really about us all coming together to support each other. Mentorship played a huge role in my life. I would not be here without people pouring into me. I was a knucklehead as a youth, was facing over 20 years in prison for my behavior at the age of 17. Spent my whole senior year of high school behind bars. And I met some young men who changed my life, young men who had very tough situations they came through. And they believed in me when they didn't believe in themselves. And when I got out of jail and they said, Kwame, do not forget us and go as far as you can go. So I dedicated my career these past 20 years to really trying to help young people not make the decisions I made and reach their full potential. So I want you to come along with me on this journey to get involved in mentorship. We need you. And I think we're going to walk through a slide here. And I don't know if I have a, a clicker or not. But um, this is our mission here. And this gives you a little bit of information about what we do uh, here in Atlanta. But it's really about defending the potential. That's what I say. It's, it's really that, that easy. This is not something that requires a degree or anything like that. What's going on, brother? Good to see you. Another one of our supporters. Uh, and it's really about how can we, you know, serve all of the different counties here. But we really want to focus particularly today on DeKalb. But this just gives you a picture of our reach. We cover all 12 counties. Uh, we work with young people who are definitely in need. Uh, but I think what's important on this data slide is what's at the bottom, is that all the young people we support have 100 percent of potential. And that's what it's all about. So let me give you some of the results, right, which is super important because it's really about what this can do for a community. I've been pushing my whole entire adult life to keep kids in school and keep them learning. I'm a C student. I try to keep things very simple. And if we can keep young people in school and get them out of high school, if you don't know already, you know today that that is the fastest way out of poverty is a high school diploma. It is not the end at all. But if we can at least help young people stay in school, and keep learning, that's our best shot. So this is what mentorship produces, not only for the young people that we support, but also for the mentors. Any big that I talk to will tell you they get more out of this than they put in. So by becoming a mentor, you guys become a better person, right? So this is something everybody should subscribe to be a part of. But we need more of this, and this is what mentorship 
is all about and this is what it can create. So let's talk about the need here. We got a lot of matches, and when I say matches, that means we have an adult who's working with a young person, a little in our program, so the big and the little coming together. So we got about 245 matches right now in DeKalb County, and you can see it's a pretty even split between boys and girls. But we actually got a lot of young people on a waiting list, about 150 boys that are waiting. These are young men that have come in and say, hey, I need someone to walk alongside life with me. So our goal is to get 50 boys matched. Um, the women, you all step up in an amazing way. Like you all just have this charitable bone already in you all that, you know, it's just natural for you all to serve. So we, we know you all are going to come along anyway, right? So really our push right now is to get more men to first know that there's a waiting list. Because many times when I talk to groups of men, they just don't know. They don't know that there's a waiting list. They may not even know about us. So now that you know, we have young men who are waiting, and whether this is for you or for someone you know, this is something that everyone can get involved in and support young people. So what does it mean to be a big, right? It is, again, something that anyone can do. It is not a lot of different requirements. We just want caring adults who want to pour into young people. We have a whole process to support you, uh, which is different about our mentoring program. Uh, when you come in, there's an orientation. That's the first step. We're going to talk a little bit about that, where you can learn about the program, see if it's a good fit for you. But what I think you got to get your head wrapped around is this whole year, one, one year commitment. Right? When I talk to the fellas, you know, I can say everything about the program, but then when I get to the commitment part, the one year, that's when I start losing, losing the fellas. But it's a one-year commitment for a reason. Because we know if you come in a young person's life and leave within a year, you can do more damage than good. Best practice for us, right? We want you to spend some time throughout the month. And what I tell people, it's not about creating new time. We're all busy. We can't create new time. But how can you incorporate young people into your existing time? things that you already do, going out to the park, going to the grocery store, teaching about healthy eating, budgeting, things that you already do. That's what we encourage you to think about as you bring a young person uh, into your life. I mentored, when I got to Big Brothers, of course, I had to become a big myself, right? And what's interesting, the way God works, I mentioned to you all that I spent some time in jail, and it was a young man in, in solitary confinement with me next door, and his name was Anthony. And Anthony would continue to get in fights, come back to solitary, go back and come back. And I said to Anthony one time, I said, man, Anthony, why do you keep getting in all these fights and come into solitary confinement? And he said something to me that stuck with me. He said, Kwame, your father comes to see you every week. I said, yeah, he does. He said, my father's in the next unit and I met him here for the first time. So fast forward 20 years, I joined Big Brothers and Big Sisters and I get matched with a young man named Anthony. And Anthony was eight years old at the time. His father died when he was about five in a motorcycle accident. And his mom came in and just needed someone to walk through life with him. So it's something I did. It made me a better person. I incorporated Anthony into my life. And it was, it was very seamless. So after you go through our process, we have a training for you. We support you so you get a coach in our program. You're not on your own. We set you up with a plan, give you ideas, help, help you troubleshoot if issues come up with the family. So this is a full service program. You're not in it alone. We match you based on where you live. So we're not going to match you with someone who lives on the south side of Atlanta. That's very difficult to maintain that relationship. And we're also going to match you based on preference, right? Because we know in relationships, preference preference matters. So let me keep, I know we got a lot to cover. So this gives you some of the upcoming uh, engagements that we're going to have. I'll leave it up for you to take a, take a picture of, but this is not going to be a one-time thing for us. We're going to continue to be here, work with Commissioner Bradshaw and others to get more young men and women matched in the program. So again, this is, this is really about matching young people. If, if this is not a good fit for you now, help me you know, reach out to a couple people in your, in your network. If you're a part of a church, a part of a corporation, an organization, bring us in to talk about how we can uh, make more matches in DeKalb and make mentorship a part of what we do here. So with that, I'm going to pause and see if you pinned if I, if I missed anything. Uh, and I know we're going to do questions at the, at the end. Um, but uh, if not, I'll bring you back up and keep it rolling. Thank you all.
you, Kwame. Um, you did an amazing job. The only things that I will um, add for clarity are around process. So I wanted to lift that, yes, we are having two recruitment events here in DeKalb County, one hosted by our friend, Pastor Simmons. Also, we are having one um, at Clarkston First Baptist Church. I have some flyers in the back that look exactly like what you saw on the screen back on the Big Brothers Big Sisters table. They have the QR code there. That initial inquiry is only seven questions, right? So it's just basically your basic information so that we can get back in touch with you. And like Kwame said, you would attend that orientation or that recruitment event so you could learn more about the program and make sure that it is right for you or your friend or whoever you invite. And we, we do urge you to invite folks. Um, from a data perspective, we are starting with um, the District 4 wait list, which is about 50 boys, but we have about 150 on the wait list throughout the cab. So this is just the beginning. And again, I want to thank Commissioner Bradshaw for standing with us. For, uh, I also want to thank Pastor Simmons for standing with us. And the many others that I haven't met yet, but I've connected through email in this room that says they will stand with us so that we can meet the need of every child in the cab that needs a mentor. That is our big vision. And again, this is just the beginning. Um, I will say when you try the QR code, if you have any trouble with it on your phone, I have hard copies in the back as well. Same seven questions. Fill it out. We will get back in touch with you the same way. Um, lastly, again, if you are not able to become a big, share the information. Um, we did a, a campaign with the city of Atlanta and one thing that the mayor uh, was able to do, the former mayor was to um, solicit the help of all of the departments. So you are here today, department heads if you can share um, our flyer and some additional information that I can share with you with your department we would greatly appreciate that as well. Um, the way you can get back in touch with me, my cards are in the back, and if you have a card, just drop it in the basket, and I assure you, I will follow up with you. So hopefully, between those online, which you will also see the QR code or the inquiry link um, from Carrie during the chat, uh, we will get at least 50 inquiries between those in the room and those online in this event, and then we will build upon it throughout the campaign, which will last for 50 days, and I promise promise you at the end of 50 days, we plan to meet our goal and we plan to celebrate together as a community. So thank you for uh, allowing us to share that. Next on the agenda, we have updates from the DeKalb County Health Initiative uh, from Dr. Spivey, who is the Program Manager of Health Assessment um, and Promotion, again from the Division of Community Health, DeKalb County Board of Health. Dr. Spivey. Good morning and greetings from the DeKalb County Board of Health. On behalf of our district health director, Dr. Sandra Valenciano and the DeKalb County Board of Health family. As mentioned, my name is Sedessa Spivey. I am the manager of the Health Assessment and Promotion Department, and I'm here to provide you some updates on COVID-19 as well as our mobile units efforts. I also would like to thank Dr. Um, Valenciano for her support and having us provide updates as well as giving some updates on the mobile clinics. Also, thank you, Commissioner Bradshaw, for the invitation. And I'm not sure how to work this. The green button on the top. Okay. Okay. COVID-19 updates. As of last week, there have been over 165,000 confirmed COVID-19 cases in DeKalb County, with more than 9,900 hospitalizations and just 1,700 deaths. 
This presents 7.4% of all COVID cases in Georgia and 5.1% of all deaths in Georgia. The next slide, you will see that daily COVID-19 cases counts in blue and cumulative COVID-19 cases counts in orange. You can also see the surges that we have had over the course of the pandemic. The original strain surged in the summer of 2020 and the alpha variant in the winter of 2020, followed by a delta surge in the summer of 2021. Most recently, you can see the dramatic vertical surge in cases through, due to the spread of the original Omicron variant in the winter of 2021. Closer to the present, you can see another bump which comprises the recent surge of the BA2 and the BA5 subvariants. As of right now, reported cases have started to increase from the winter travel and gatherings. My next slide, you can see a subset of the previous slide that examines the last three months. The most recent seven days grayed out here is considered incomplete to compensate for any reporting lag. Cases have steadily been on the increase as we come out of the most recent surge and enter winter. But in most recent two weeks period, we are seeing cases marginally decrease again. The gray area are considered incomplete as indicated previously to accommodate for any lag reporting. Here you can see the trends in the percent positivity COVID-19 PCR cases in the cab. The bars represent the number of PCR tests performed in the cab in a 14-day period. And the orange line represents the percent of those tests that have come back positive. Recently, we have seen an increase in, positive, in test positivity even though the value have decreased in the most recent 14 day period, it is still more than double the low point from the earlier in the fall. While PCR test, a positive indicator of COVID-19 transmission in the cab, remember that this is an undercount Almost everyone uses antigen tests at home tests, which are typically not counted in these results. The next map shows that the percentage change in cases diagnosed between the most recent 14 day period being that the zip codes are colored in percent change in COVID cases. The zip codes in red has a 5% greater change between the two 14-day periods. The blue have recorded a 5% or greater decrease, and the yellow is less than 5% change. In the table, to the right, you can see those top zip codes with the total cases as well as the percent change in case counts. We ordered the zip codes with the highest number of cases, the percent that each zip code represents relative to the total cases in the cab, and then the percent change is calculated by comparing the total cases reported in the two 14-day periods. For example, since the start of the pandemic, zip code 30058 has had 12,810 COVID cases, which makes up for about 7.7% of the total cases in DeKalb County. 
Between the two 14-day periods, there, ha there was a 3.9% decrease in these cases. 1,091 COVID cases were diagnosed in the most recent 14-day periods and 11.7% 11, 11 increase from the previous 14-day period. While this is a decrease, the number of cases and rates still remain high. That right there provides our um, summary of our COVID-19 updates. The next part of the presentation will be a summary of our efforts related to our mobile health clinic strategy. Um, during the pandemic, we acquired mobile health clinics. We actually acquired 10 of those. Um, we use those mobile clinics to go into the community in particular areas to actually administer vaccines as well as provide additional services. Um, the results of those efforts from May 2021 to June 2022, we were able to host over 458 events throughout DeKalb County. We vaccinated over 493 uh, individuals. Our priority area was definitely DeKalb, South DeKalb where there were high rates, um, high case rates, as well as low vaccination rates. Um, we hosted about 330 events in South DeKalb, which represented 70% of the total vaccinations, as well as about uh, our over 14,000 vaccination. As we move forward, we will continue to focus on those areas um, that are of most needs, primarily in South DeKalb, prioritizing zip codes as seen such as 30083 or 30038. We continue to look at our data to really understand and prioritize those different zip codes. Um, as you're aware, DeKalb County makes up, uh, African Americans make up about 55% of DeKalb County, so our priority population is African Americans. We continue to look at characteristics such as high risk of chronic diseases, limited health care access, high poverty rates, as well as low vaccination rates. As we begin to transition from COVID to look at expanding our service, deploying all of our mobile units within DeKalb County, we are looking at a phased approach. Starting this year, we will start deploying our units with limited services, such as family planning, immunization, or vaccination always will continue. And then our phase two would be years two to four to continue to phase in different services. Our next steps, we are beginning to formulate a strategy to look at different areas or different zip codes. One key point that I will say, we will continue to focus on COVID. However, what is really important are our community partners. I indicated that we did over 400 events within the community. That cannot occur without our community partners, so we will continue to do so. Uh, we have an online process where anyone that's interested could actually request us to come into the community to provide those services. That concludes my presentation. Thank you.
back, like a recurring nightmare, I'm back. Uh, I'm going to disrupt the flow for just a moment before I yield back to you, Pindy, to keep us on track. But we have a very special guest with us this morning, a uh, man I've gotten to know over the past six years while we've been on this journey of public service together. Y'all all know him. So uh, without any further preamble, I'm going to yield the floor to the CEO of DeKalb County, Michael Thurman. Steve Bradshaw for the invitation and more importantly for his friendship and his outstanding service uh, to the residents and citizens of DeKalb County. Uh, he has been a phenomenal asset in addition to our governing authority and I just enjoy working with him. So let's give him a round of applause. Thank you so much. For this. He's a military man, so you know he he loves to give orders, and I follow him. That's what I do. That's what I do. Also, my fellow uh, DeKalb County employees, uh, public servants who you have met, Dr. Spivey, always good. We worked together throughout the pandemic uh, on multiple, multiple occasions, and she's a phenomenal uh, leader uh, in the healthcare field. I see my chef. I always recognize the chef, right? Y'all should recognize her too, a lady who carried the keys to the jail in her purse, you know. <laughs> you never know, right? You never know. And of course, I see rep two representatives uh, here who serving under the Gold Dome, a uh, young man, brother, who works for the cab, a brilliant attorney just recently. Stand up, representative. Y'all get to know this man, <laughs> Representative Omar. Representative Davis, who used to just torment me at all the meetings. <laughs> Give her a hand. I love her. Doing a wonderful job. And thank you all for being public. Oh, my probate judge, she tell me, sooner or later, you got to come see me because you're going to die, right? So get a probate judge a round of applause back there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, but thank you all so much for investing in our children and seeing it is not robbery to give your time and your energy, and most importantly, your concern and your love uh, for the children of this county and our state. Nothing can be more important. And you know, my it's been written that speeches and sermons are well, but the most persuasive and compelling sermons are not those that we speak, but it's those that we live. And when you reach out, spend time with a child, it is the most profound, compelling and important sermon you can teach. And it's children in your neighborhood, it's your own children, it's your grandchildren. Uh, it's just simple things that make a difference. In my previous life as a school superintendent, I would always say to parents, you know, when the kids come in from school, uh, you see them in the afternoon, Damon, what happened that day at school? And what did they always say? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, third, Friday. What happened today at school? Nothing. But you have to understand, it's not the answer, but it's the question that matters. Because we ask questions about things that are what? Important. What was KF3 today? What was the lotto number? <laughs> That's important, right? <laughs> Who won the division of playoff last Saturday? I see a Cowboy fan out there between uh, San Francisco. So what was the score? Hey, <laughs> I see another Cowboy jacket back there, too. You're not alone today. But, no, that's important. You ask those questions because those questions are important. If you never ask your child what happened in school, what message are you conveying? You don't care. You don't care. Not important. And oftentimes, things that are not important to us become what? Not important to them. So ask the question irrespective of the answer because the answer is not all. And every now and then you might get an answer, but the answer is not that important. It's the question. It's the question. How are you doing? What's happening in your life? What can I do to help? 
finally, <laughs> homework, you know, kids, they say homework matters if you can do the homework. I often tell the story, you know, in school, I still remember my dad between the cotton fields and the chicken poultry where he worked that night. Some evenings he would sit there and help me with my homework. And Miss Viola, that was just the most amazing time in my life, sitting there with my daddy, helping with my homework. And I guess, Major, I may have been in the fourth or fifth grade. And we were learning to spell the states. And I challenged my daddy to spell Mississippi. <laughs> He couldn't spell it. And I laughed, Daddy can't spell Mississippi. Too many doggone S's can't spell Mississippi. So it might have been a couple of days later, my mom called me aside and said, don't ever do that to your dad again. Don't embarrass your daddy, because your daddy can't read or write. And I felt bad, I feel bad telling you all this story now. But when I thought about it, it's just, well, if daddy can't read or write, how was he helping me with my homework all those years? How was he helping me with the science and the math and the reading and the writing? The man can't read or write. Well, I figured it out when I had a door. See, daddy couldn't read or write, but he was present. Years later, my, my daughter taking advanced geometry, heck, I couldn't do it either. She asked me to help her, I couldn't do nothing. But you know, I said, well, baby, I'll sit here with you, I'll be present. <laughs> so what we can do with our kids is our clothes. You know, we may not have all advanced education and skills and knowledge and expertise, but if we are just what? Present. It can make all the difference in the world. Thank y'all, thank you. for those remarks and for joining us, CEO. We really appreciate your time with us this morning, being present. I agree, um, especially with mentorship. You do not have to have a degree. You do not have to have a certain status, as some people think. You just need to be present with a caring heart, um, and we welcome all those who want to join that mission. Next on our agenda, we are going to hear from the police department. And I will say on the next section, um, I have the names of the people who were scheduled to be here. If there is a different person, please come up and charge it to my head and not my heart. But from the police department, we have Major Ford bringing remarks from that department. Is that right? Good morning, everyone. So I'm not Major Ford, but I am your police chief, Martha Ramos, and what I wanted to do was take a moment to introduce newly promoted Major Harden, and he is responsible now for the Tucker Precinct. And then we have newly promoted Captain Berg, and he is overseeing part of the East Precinct. So you have both precincts here today. And they will be addressing any of your concerns, but I really just wanted to take a moment because it's important for me, as the CEO has said, to be present, for you to understand that as your chief, not only do I support my staff, but I support the community, I support Commissioner Bradshaw. Whatever we do, we need to stand together because together we are definitely stronger. And so I'm here to support my people, but I'm here to support my people as well. So my people go this way. So I'm really here just to say that we are here for you. We are your police department, whatever it is that you need, we're here to serve you, and we want to make sure that you know who it is that services your police areas, and that's why they're here today and we'll be addressing you. I have a couple business cards if anybody needs them, but realistically, these are your go-to people. If you come to me, that's perfectly fine, but all I'm going to do is come to Major Harden 
And then I want you to know because they are the ones on the ground. They're the ones you can just walk in to the priest and say, I would like to speak to Major Hardin. And so it's important for you to know who it is that's servicing your community. I service your county, but they actually service your community. So just wanted to take a moment to say that and just to tell you that I am happy to be here. Major Hardin. And they gave us this wonderful mic and a place to sit, so I, I just won't stand over there. Uh, uh, I'll start with Mr. Johnson. Sorry for interrupting your thing to stepping outside, but I, I really appreciated that presentation. The Big Brothers is a wonderful program. I have a business card, and I, I, don't, I, I just missed your face. So if you're still in the room, please don't leave. There you are. Please don't leave before we can exchange some, some information. I have a, a couple questions for you for the community. So um, I'll keep this pretty brief because there's a lot of people on the agenda that need to speak. Uh, but I am Major Harden. I have um, I was not born and raised in Georgia. I know we've discussed that with people that are all coming here to the South. I have, Syracuse is absolutely a place. I lived upstate New York for a while myself, but moved here from Southern California. So I love it here, though. I did go to school here. Um, I frequented DeKalb County. I played where Stonecrest was before Stonecrest was a mall. So I absolutely enjoy the community and the people that are here. So we're here to serve. Captain Berg is in the same boat. Um, I won't go into details and all the, the ins and outs of, of numbers because that is boring and nobody really wants to know that. If you really want to know that, please uh, communicate with me and I'm, I'm happy to do so. We want to just push that we are always here in the community. Uh, every month, each precinct holds a community engagement meeting. Currently, that's still on Zoom, which I kind of prefer. I love this, this hybrid thing. I like to you know, see people in person, but we are able to reach so many more in the different communities uh, via Zoom, especially our elderly um, and otherwise unable to attend in person individuals. So those are being pushed out on Nextdoor uh, and Instagram and those things. So if you're not on Nextdoor in your community, please get on Nextdoor. Please follow our Facebook pages. We share these things for a reason. And if you're not engaged with us, then we don't know that you have a problem. We also have clergy meetings. So clergy member, thank you. Uh, you must be Catholic because I know I'm Catholic and that's about the Catholic sermon from this morning. I appreciate it. Um, and of course, our public education specialists uh, at East Precinct, that's Mrs. Weber. Um, and for Tucker Precinct, that's Ms. Mann. And they do a great job of really uh, Binding together the community. They will help you with neighborhood watch if you don't have one. They will help to make sure that you are getting these emails and notifications of our majors night out when we're over in the businesses discussing things with them because a lot of our business owners aren't residents. So they need to be able to have a voice where they work and where they play as well. So, um, Always hiring as well. So those out here that know someone that would like to be a police officer, not a sheriff's deputy, <laughs> please uh, please join the DeKalb County Police Department. We are a wonderful place to work. I've been here since 2005, and while we have ups and downs, I love it here. I plan on retiring from here. I have about nine more years to go on that, so I look forward to continuously serving with you all and even after that into retirement. So please, please, please encourage those that you uh, love and know to to come and join us so that we can continue a partnership, especially within this uh, in this community. So uh, that's all I have for the police department side. Ken Murphy, everything to add or anything? Uh, just real quick, I don't think I can add anything much further than uh, Major Harden. Uh, I've been with the DeKalb County Police Department for almost 25 years. Uh, I recently came from Tucker Precinct as a lieutenant, uh, recently promoted to captain and the assistant commander over at East Precinct, which is our Stonecrest, Lithonia area. It is a very big opportunity. I've never actually worked this precinct, so I've been here about a week, and I'm trying to learn as much of the territory and as much of the, uh, the people in the community that I can. Uh, we have several great programs, as Major Harden introduced um, our engagements. We have our community engagement meetings. We also have our Majors Night Out, which is our uh, last Monday of every month, and we also have the last Wednesday of every month. We have a Zoom clergy meeting. And we also have our coffee with a cop, but that's kind of intermittent. We usually have that once a month at different coffee shops or a pancake house or IHOP, something like that. But I am very delighted to be here today, and thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to serve you. I'm still working on new business cards, so if anybody needs a number for East Precinct, I can give you uh, verbally my, um, at the end of the meeting, verbally my uh, uh, direct line. And as always, my number is still 911. Yeah. 
Thank you for those remarks from the police department. I will say as a resident, we have um, great police in our community. They, you don't hate to see them coming because they are always helpful um, and they treat you fairly. That's my experience with uh, DeKalb County's police department. Um, and I was raised by a policeman, so maybe I'm a little biased, but yes. Um, also, we are going to be joined by the code enforcement um, department. I have down Tim Hardy, if Mr. Hardy is here. Yes, ma'am. All right, great, thank you. There we go. All right, thanks. Um, as, um, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> get time to talk, now get choked up. So as, as the um, uh, introducer said, my name is Timothy Hardy. I am Deputy Director for Code Compliance for DeKalb County. Uh, code Compliance, uh, we wear a lot of hats. We have a lot of duties. We primarily enforce the county's uh, property maintenance codes, zoning codes, uh, business license, pretty much anything to do with regulatory compliance. Um, we have a, a staff of 57. Uh, we operate on about a little over $5 million budget. Um, we have about 43 field officers uh, currently. And we are hiring two. Uh, as the police said, we got about six or seven openings. So if you uh, are interested or know someone that uh, might be a good fit for us, we'd certainly love to, uh, to bring you aboard. I'll give a little couple of highlights of uh, 2022. Um, just from the notes that I bought, uh, one of the, the things we, or a couple of things we do from a proactive enforcement standpoint is our multifamily enforcement program, our hotel motel enforcement, as well as our uh, amendment abatement. We've recently added a commercial quarter inspection team. Uh, that team uh, was put together towards the middle of 2019. Um, our goal is to touch uh, every commercial property in, um, I'm sorry, every commercial commercial property on the commercial corridors within the Cap County over a five year period. Uh, we feel like we've um, had a pretty uh, robust year. Uh, recently, the um, video uh, surveillance ordinance has passed. Uh, code compliance will be the primary enforcement arm in that. There are a bit over 250 um, convenience stores and gas stations that we'll be looking at to make ensure that they have the proper equipment in, in place. Um, recently, we completed about 54 sweeps in our multifamily program, uh, issued more than 733 citations, uh, collected a little over $260 in fines. In our hotel motel sweeps, we completed 17, issued another 86 citations for a little over $22,000 in fines. Uh, we've completed um, 12 sign sweeps, and if you are not familiar with the sign sweeps, what we do is once a month, every Friday, my entire uh, field staff take their, their county trucks and they um, pick up signs or remove signs from the public right of way in unincorporated DeKalb County. And uh, recently, uh, just this year, we had collected over a little over 19.5 tons. All of those signs typically um, go to the landfill, which my colleague here uh, operates, and um, <clears throat> we just try to keep the right of way clean. It, the amazing thing is no matter how many signs we remove on a day, a week later, the signs are back in the same place. So it's it's a continuous effort. Uh, we have some other um, county agencies that help us out a little bit uh, with uh, KDB and roads and drainage as well. Um, we completed 19 quarter sweeps. That's uh, a commercial quarters that I mentioned earlier. Uh, issued a little, a little over 357 citations and collected a little $108,000 in fines. Okay. Thank you. That's all I have. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Hardy, for that, and thank you for all that your department does. Thank you for getting those signs up. Definitely an unincorporated cab where I live. Thank you for your service. Uh, next, we will have a presentation from Sanitation, and is that Ms. Hutchison here it with is. us today? Yes, I've Tracy been Hutchinson. emailing with you. Oh. Thank you. Welcome, Ms. Tracy Hutchinson. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning to everyone. I am Tracy Hutchinson. I am the Sanitation and Beautification Director. I do have a few slides that I would like to go over this morning. The green one? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. 
<laughs> so a few, just a few slides. I did bring in the uh, 2023 residential uh, calendar. So they're out front um, on the table. And please take note of uh, the calendar as usual. Whenever there is a holiday, um, we run one day behind. So we run one day behind whenever there's a holiday. So our next holiday is going to be President's Day, which is uh, Monday, February 20th. And we, again, we'll be running one day behind when we come around to pick your garbage up. Also, please note some of the events that's going to be held in 2023 for sanitation. By popular demand, we added paper shredding. We added a second event. Um, the paper shredding was so, so popular, and residents have been calling calling saying, hey, can you guys have another event where we actually have the shredders on site? The trucks are there, the residents bring in boxes and boxes of paper. I thought really only my mom had accumulated so much of paper, but when I see people bring in boxes and boxes of paper to be shredded, um, but take advantage of that. Please take advantage of that. Um, so the first event is actually going to be in May. So for if you guys got any Family members, friends, anybody in DeKalb County, we, you know, we just need for you to be in line. It is a four-hour event. There is a lot of cars. Be patient. The trucks will be there. We're going to get you in and out. Um, but the first event is going to be May, May 6th, and the other event is going to be in September. Also, we have our Household Hazardous Waste event. Again, we have the cars come in. We need police to help us with that much traffic coming in. You could bring up to 10 containers of paint. Ten, paint is our biggest one. People have a lot of leftover paint at the house. Um, but, but take note of that also. Come early, have some patience, but it's very, very organized, and you should be able to get in and out without any issues. But the calendars are out front. If anyone needs a calendar, you can always call our call center, and uh, we will be able to mail the uh, calendars to any resident. And just as an FYI, our building opened back up. We are open. The lobby is open Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Anyone that needs to come to the sanitation department, please feel free to come to our building to handle any type of your solid waste services. Um, we're located right off Memorial Drive um, off Kensington. Uh, when you right behind the jail, you can't, can't really hard to miss us. Um, but, you know, if anything, if, if all fails, just follow one of our trash trucks and they're going to be probably coming to the transfer station to dump out the garbage. Um, so with that being said, let me, because I know we have a lot of presentations, and I kind of went over some of the things already. So again, our lobby is open from 9 to 3, and of course our call center, you can still call us from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m., um, and we still have a lot of um, folks that actually um, come in person to the building using the call center, and then of course any type of payments that you want to make online, you can make them online, then we have a mailbox right outside the front of the building also. And of course, just want to go over, you know, everyone, um, our standard garbage roll cart in DeKalb County now is a 95 gallon trash can. Um, so th those cans are, that's the standard cart. Um, also, we do still offer backdoor service for residents that have, you know, any type of medical needs where they can't take that roll cart down to the curb. That application is online also. And then you can always call our call center. And I'm looking for the number up here. The call Call center telephone number is 404-294-2900 for anyone that needs to call into our call center. And I'm sorry, but I think my public my uh, manager failed to put the number on there, but it's 404-294-2900. The recycling program still exists. The program is in place. Um, residents can have a 35-gallon uh, recycling roll cart, or you could pay a one-time fee of $15, and you could get the 65-gallon uh, um, roll cart. Biggest thing I really want to talk about is we have more and more garbage is just being created on a weekly basis. 
we have a lot of excess overflow bags that um, that now require you to actually um, call in for a special pickup and it is a charge now it's been a charge it's been that way for the past couple of years um, once the 95 gallon cart came into place any excess overflow ba bags is a charge we ask residents to go ahead and get a second row cart if you have a lot of excess garbage go ahead and get a second row cart because this all the excess overflow is going to be a charge and it has been that way for years already but we're still in the education process with a lot of residents and so um, just want to be sure that everyone has a clear understanding that we serve we're going to pick up the roll cart so we when we get to your house we're going to roll that cart to the truck hook it up to the tipper drop it into the uh, hopper of the truck um, excess bags everything needs to be containerized everything needs to be in a roll cart now of course we know we have a lot of the evictions we have a lot of rent landlord evictions then we have the marshal evictions so with that being said those are paid the marshal evictions are not paid piles we actually go out there and we pick those up um, as a part of the eviction process through the marshal's office so any resident that need a second trash roll cart please contact our office and you order a second roll cart um, the second roll cart your annual assessment fee does increase when you get the second roll cart so when you look at it um, the special collection fee for us to come back and pick up the excess bags overflow the minimum charge is fifty dollars that's the minimum rate. And so is, you know, when you could just get the second roll cart, it's a lot easier just to get the second roll cart if you know you have excess garbage every week. These are, I think this is probably our number one phone call. These special collections, big piles, bulk piles. Some of them looks like, like you got three or four bedroom houses just sitting out there to the curb that someone just put out there. So, uh, matter of fact, when I was coming in this morning, is this Park, is it Parkdale? Scottdale? Parkdale? What's the road that comes up? Parkdale. There's a abandoned house right here, and it's got a pile out there. So I stopped and took a picture of it, because you got this beautiful center here, beautiful, nice neighborhood, and there's that pile that just an eyesore, just sitting there. So I'll send a truck back next week to come pick that one up, because it's abandoned. Normally, I would be contacting Tim. Tim and I work very, very closely together because when residents call us, they're like, you know, sanitation, y'all need to come pick it up. We don't have enforcement. We provide our core service is sanitation. There is no enforcement from sanitation. So we have to contact Tim, I'm sorry, Mr. Hardy, code enforcement to say, hey, Tim, can you go out there and look at this pile, uh, see what's going on with this resident? Because more than likely, we have already left what's called a special collections authorization form, letting the resident know that it is a charge for sanitation to pick it up. Most residents pay. We really don't have a problem with a lot of residents. Some residents just like, nope, I never got the scaff. I'm totally unaware of it. When did y'all put this in place? And so there is a process, but you know, a lot of time it's just about education. But we have been using these scaffs. I've been with sanitation 18 years. We've been using the same program for the past 18 years. However, in the past though, we would pick up excess bags, but like I said, that stopped some years ago. So when you look at this, you got tree parts, large amounts of yard debris. Um, the tree trimmer, I mean the tree, the, the, the tree, the, uh, I'm sorry, the contractor would come by, cut the tree up for the resident and tell the resident, oh, the Cap County Sanitation, they'll pick it up for you. We will pick it up for a charge. We're not going to pick it up for free. And a lot of the contractors tell the residents that, oh, San you just called the Cap County Sanitation, they'll come. All that is actually um, piles that need to be paid, and the fee must be paid up front. So we have a lot of um, construction and demolition material. And of course, you look to see the co mingle piles. When I call a co mingle pile, a co mingle pile is when you got furniture, you got yard debris, you got construction, you got mattresses, you got sofas, you got everything out there. That's a co mingle pile. That is, that is a special collection pile. And then, of course, in the where we, when COVID hit and everybody was ordering online, we have so many 
cardboard boxes at the curb now that folks just throw out there that, that they don't flatten them. We, our collectors, we don't flatten boxes. So we need to spend about, if we at your house more than a couple of minutes, we've, we've been there too long. So we service, each truck goes out and we service on a daily basis somewhere between, you know, 11 to about 13 to 1400 houses in a day per truck. We don't have a lot of time to pick up excess bags because we have to complete that route that day. If we don't complete that route that day, then Commissioner Bradshaw is often going to get the phone call in the email or uh, the CEO office is going to get it. The phone calls come from all over the place. So we start at 7 o'clock in the morning. Our standard time is 7 to 5.30. And you will see us out there to 6, 6.30, 7, 7.30 sometimes because we're out there trying to get the routes up. That's why the excess and all of the big piles, it's a totally different truck. The standard rear loader that comes to your house, we should, be, we should be in and to your house and past your house within about a minute and a half. Because we got 10 hours to get it done. Some trucks come in a little bit earlier, but depending on what our staffing is, you know, we may be out there a little bit later than that. And of course, I talked about our public events. We're so, um, we put this in our budget every year, but like I said, by popular demand, we, we increase the paper shredding events. Oh, there's our call center number. I'm sorry, so I just said my manager didn't put it in. She did put it in. So the call center number is 404-294-2900. We have a general email box at Sanitation. Um, we have a dedicated staff person that answers those emails every day. Um, if you go online, we have a very, very up-to-date website. Feel free to go on the website um, because there's a lot of information that is available. And I would like to put out there also that we're hiring also, because <laughs> every department in the county is. <laughs> but we're hiring also. Um, if you, um, we have a lot of, you know, of course, I'm a female. I'm the female, uh, first female director for sanitation. But we have a lot of female drivers. We have female collectors. Um, but we hire, uh, you know, young men, young ladies. Um, we don't discriminate on age or anything like that either, um, because. Um, but it's a great job. You know, we hard working department. We're one of the essential departments. Residents know us, they look forward to seeing us every week. They know our trucks, they know our drivers, they know our collectors. Thank you guys for uh, always uh, recognizing us, even in the summertime, giving us cold water, Powerade, Gatorade, so we certainly appreciate it. Um, but we definitely are hiring. If anybody know any, anybody with a CDL, we need some drivers big time. But we need collectors also, but we cannot move the truck without the CDL driver. Um, but if you know anyone that's you know, looking for a job, please go to our website. We actually can make on the, on the site offers to a collector or a crew worker or a um, CDL driver. We work that closely with human resources that if someone comes and says they're looking for a job, we could get in touch with HR and actually make you a contingent offer that day. So I would like to keep that in mind also. So again, anybody that's looking for a job, please tell them to uh, push them towards sanitation. And thank you. Um, <laughs> we got the, uh, <laughs> well, you got to meet a certain background to be the police. See, with us, uh, <laughs> we, if you go walk and chew gum at the same time, we could take you. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Hutchison. We're glad you were able to get that um, presentation in because it was very helpful. Um, last but not least, we are going to hear from Planning and Sustainability. If they are here, I have down uh, Mr. Cedric Hudson. Is Mr. Hudson here today? No, no. Okay. You want to? Oh, Larry's here. Okay. Yeah, wait a minute. Cedric's not here. Larry. No, no. Uh, you know, you know. I'm the wing guy. I'm the wing guy. 
Uh, my name is Larry Washington. I'm in the planning department. Uh, before I get started, I want to thank Commissioner Bradshaw for the invitation, and then thank you for having us. Uh, joining me also is Sylvia Smith. She is the manager for Long Range Division, and I'm the uh, Long Range Planning Administrator. Uh, just want to highlight a few things that has taken place within the planning department. Um, the planning department is made up of four divisions. You have the Long Range Division, which Sylvia and I uh, work, uh, which develops policies for the county long range plans. Uh, so we develop plans for five, 10, 15, 20 years of how the county should shape and look throughout the course of those years. And we just wrapped up a uh, 2050 comprehensive plan, which Sylvia will talk more about. Also, we have the current planning division, which deals with everyday planning. Uh, 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 they deal with the regulatory planning that goes on. When you see developers out here, you see uh, people who want to do things to the house, they have to go to the planning department and deal with our current planning uh, uh, team. Uh, planning, um, when, you, when you hear them going through the board, uh, they, they do the staff analysis and give reports on uh, uh, what uh, is out there currently on the field. That's our current. Uh, current uh, division. Also, we have the permit and inspection division. Uh, those who go out and inspect developers, inspect, inspect uh, buildings and so on like that. And then lastly, we have our business license division who issues business license and alcohol license. So some of the exciting things that's taken place in, within our division, we just opened up the one-stop shop. And this is designed to uh, streamline the people who want to do business in the county. We have facilitated all of the uh, uh, development services in one location. It used to be where you, you would have to go all around the county just to get business done in the county, but we have been able to successfully facilitate one location for all that to happen and under one roof. So uh, we are excited about that and we are open now for our business community to come in and do uh, business with the county. And hopefully this way it will speed up the process. I know people will say, oh man, it's difficult doing business in the county, but this way right here, we believe that we could serve the citizens of DeKalb County more efficiently. So uh, the county is open, it's the one-stop shop and we're excited about it. Uh, also, another initiative is the Neighborhood 101. Uh, this is important too because it helps uh, the community, uh, well, it helps the planning department to go out to the community and empower the community about what is planning. How do you advocate for services in your community as it relates to planning? And how do you be more informed of what's happening in your community, right? Uh, you, many times you will ride in your community it's like, oh, what is this being built? Or what's happening right here? Or I didn't know about this meeting. Um, so what we want to do is get out in the community and educate our uh, citizens on what is planning? How does it work? How can it work for us in my community? So uh, Neighborhood 101 is very important. It's coming up. That's a new initiative. And if you want more information about it, uh, please feel free to go on the Planning and Sustainability website and or reach out to myself or Sylvia uh, about that initiative. And then lastly, um, we are also doing the uh, Memorial Drive. Uh, I think um, Commissioner Bradshaw mentioned that early on. Uh, we're doing a lot of work on Memorial Drive. I mean, the resurgency of Memorial Drive is really coming back. Uh, we have a lot of development that's taking place, a lot of applications from developers that's coming online on that corridor. We have uh, members of the community that's really not just talking about change, but putting their hands to the plow to bring change as well. So and that's called the Community Action Group where members in the community who are uh, doctors, nurses, uh, lawyers, grants, writers, and, and so on are volunteering their time and uh, expertise to come on the corridor and uh, push the needle forward. And they're working along with myself, Commissioner Bradshaw, to do just that. And if you're interested in actually getting involved in uh, changing your community, not just by words, but through action, uh, feel free to uh, inquire on the community action groups that's in place now. Uh, so with that being said, I'll turn it over to Sylvia for her to, uh, for her to give a couple of remarks, and we'll go from there. Sylvia. Thank you, Larry. Good morning, everyone. Again, my name is Sylvia Smith. I'm the planning manager for Long Range. And uh, there are a lot of good things going on in this area. Uh, Commissioner Bradshaw talked about the Kensington Martyr Station. Now, with the K Kensington Martyr Station, not only is there a soccer soccer station there, but we're also working on a Kensington Master Plan with MARTA. And so if you have not heard or you have not 
read any of the documents, I encourage you to go onto our website and get more information about it. Um, right now it's going through zoning and it's going to be a mixed use development that's going along in that master plan. And so I ask you to really get involved with that and see what we're doing and be a part. And secondly, um, the 2050 Unified Plan, as Larry stated, uh, we've been working on the 2050 Unified Plan, as the, I'm sure most of you know, for the past 18 months, that has been a really involved project, which included land use and transportation, and I want to thank you all for your input on that. Uh, we got that adopted in November, and from there, we work, We just received our locally qualified government um, um, certification from ARC. And with that plan, um, as most of you know, there has been a time where it was just land use and transportation, they were separate plans. Well, this was the first time in DeKalb that we combined those plans together uh, to bridge that gap on some things that sometimes are missing between the land use and transportation elements. And so if you have not read that plan, I encourage you to go in, review that plan on our website, and when you start on the neighborhood one-on-one -on -one that Larry will be working on, then you'll have a better understanding of what we're doing and not only that but moving forward when we do our next unified plan five years from now you can be more engaged and have a better idea of what we do and be engaged in your community uh, and lastly um, I want you to stay tuned we will be rolling out an interactive tool on our website called Granicus that will give us give you more interaction and we will be asking questions and putting out polls and we really want your input you are the community you you are the ones that make it count and so from there uh, we look forward to that Granicus rollout and so that's all I have today um, if you would like go on our website my name is on the website Larry's name is on the website you can contact us. We're friendly. We love to talk to you. We love to hear from you. And from there, I would like to say thank you. Okay, I think we have uh, one more department person here who's not on the program for my transportation department, Patrice Keeter. Don't mean to put you on the spot, but if you want to come on up and share a few things, come on, floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Hi, I'm Patrice Keeter. I'm the engineering manager for the Public Works uh, Transportation Division. Um, a lot of people ask what's the difference between Public Works and the Public uh, the Transportation Division and the Roads and Drainage Division of Public Works. And it's not this clear and easy, but in a nutshell, if it's something new, if you want a new traffic signal, if you want a new road, you want a new always stop sign, it comes out of transportation where the engineer and the studies and the funding gets developed. If you have an existing road that needs a pothole patched or an existing stop sign that's knocked down or existing traffic signal that's not working, that comes out of roads and drainage. Now it's not all that cut and dry, but that'll give you a good um, guideline to know who to call. The transportation division is a small division. We're 18 people. Uh, we have uh, two people who are dedicated to traffic calming, one person dedicated to street light, uh, two people that are dedicated to right-of-way acquisition for not only our federal aid projects and our SPLOS projects, but also for other departments. And then we have three administrative people. So that leaves about nine or ten engineers that do um, a plethora of the work in the transportation division. So what happens in transportation, we do... Um, uh, like traffic studies, uh, always stop studies, traffic signal warrant studies. We do, uh, we have a small survey crew, we have a, a small design group, we run the federal aid projects, all the GDOT infrastructure money that comes through, comes through transportation. Um, and uh, we had to do signal timing. Uh, so, and of course, we do the traffic calming, the petition programs like traffic calming, street lights, and a residential park permit parking. So, again, my name is Patrice Keeter. I'm with the Transportation Division, and I thank you for having me today. Okay, 
Okay, I think uh, Penny did that completely. Yes. Okay, so we are going to go into Q and A here in a moment, uh, and it'll be open to our uh, team up here. But I just want to express again my gratitude to Yipindi, who's going to be uh, leading us through the Q and A, but to all our departments who are represented here for just coming out and supporting uh, me and my team in this process. Uh, I really appreciate it, y'all. I'll do an outstanding job. And before I just yield, uh, I want to kind of bring us back to our main objective this morning, which is promotion of the 50 mentor, Men to Mentors program. And I'll just say a couple things, and then I'll get out of the way and, and let us have a, just a open dialogue. I'll say something first that is going to be self-evident, but I'm going to say it anyway, which is this. Boys need adult male role models. That was a pretty good clap. I'm going to say it again see if I can get a louder clap. Boys need adult male role models. That's self-evident. Now, now I, I, I'll just share this. There was a time in my life when I had a very difficult relationship with my own father. We were, we were estranged. That might be a little strong for a while now. I'm in my 50s. He's in, he, he's in his 80s. Our relationship is much better now, but there was a time when he was absent. And I stand here before you grateful to my grandfathers that I mentioned earlier because they were my role models. They were probably more influential in my life than my father was, but they were there. Now, I don't want to be misunderstood. There are single moms out there doing heroic, heroic jobs. Heroic. They deserve a hand. But what I'm reminded of as I stand here and we, we launched this program is this. Do y'all remember the movie The Boys in the Hood? Y'all remember that movie? There's a scene in that movie that resonates with me where the mom, played by Angela Bassett, who's taking their son Trey to live with his father, who's played by Lawrence Fishburne. They'd been kind of, they weren't together anymore, but they were kind of sharing custody. But she was taking her son to live with his father full time. And they're sitting in the car talking and having that exchange. And what she said was so poignant. She said, you know what? I love him to death. I've done the best I can with him, but I can't teach him how to be a man. That is your job. Men need to teach boys how to be men. So that's why I'm pushing this program so hard uh, with a focus on our boys, and uh, I hope you all will be supportive of it. And with that, I will yield back to you, Pindy, and let her guide us through the question and answer session. Thank you. Well said, Commissioner Bradshaw. Um, we are at the point of Q&A. Uh, I will be um, assisted by Carrie and some of the other folks in the room. Um, we will go through Q&A and, again, charge it to my head and not my heart if I um, have a few missteps in this process, but I'm going to do my best. Uh, once you are identified to ask your question, uh, you will be brought the microphone, and you will need to use the microphone phone so that the folks on YouTube can also hear and participate and engage with this process. If you are online, please drop your questions in the chat and we will have someone who is monitoring that process. All right. So we are opening the floor for questions. My name is Imogene Archer. And I spoke before you last meeting here at Toby Grant, and I'm addressing it again to first to the, I think Ms. Hutcherson. Okay. I am grateful that they do have females that have become truck drivers for the uh, sanitation department, but I've also complained because I live on a cul-de-sac, that your person who is filling in 
for the regular person who runs the route is coming into my driveway. I'm not going to say that again because it's a $7,000 uh, $7, driveway and I've asked you that you retrain that woman who takes over when the regular guy is not there. I've called in, I've complained, I've written, and you haven't, it hasn't been addressed properly. Matter of fact, last time around, I, made, I think it's two weeks ago, she was on duty and she, three neighbors came out. That's how long she took. She went up, she, she hit a mailbox. She won't get out of the truck. The regular guy gets out the truck because it's a cul-de-sac and he goes to every uh, rubbish container and puts it in the, the truck. The female that comes and relieves, she does not. So she does everything she can to get that rubbish can ill regardless. And that means coming into the driveway. That's got to stop. Okay, so I'm asking you to address that again and retrain your truck driver and please ask her because it is a small cul-de-sac. She's got to get out that truck and roll those carts over to the truck as the regular guy does. Okay, thank you. And as far as the um, uh, uh, code enforcement, thank you. I spoke last time and I spoke about, uh, in, on the code of SAG, uh, I, uh, basketball goal out in the, out in the street and uh, the roosters and the man doing his, his, uh, his uh, mechanical work. He's still doing the mechanical work. It's a little hard to try to get him stopped, but the other things have been resolved and I appreciate that. And I'm asking whether or not are you considering or do you have, again, volunteers that will help out with code enforcement as far as the picking up signs, doing the, uh, the uh, tall grass and jump cars because that was in existence when I was in uh, volunteer code enforcement. Do you have that again now? I'm sorry, no ma'am, not at this time. That's, that's a citizen's group, I understand, that was um, uh, operating prior to me arriving here, but there were some difficulties with that, um, primarily some legal difficulties. So I'm not opposed to it, but right now um, it does not exist. But, we, you know, we can always look into it. It's just that it's, it's, um, it's not well received. Um, at this time, just because of the, the problems that they had in the past. There were some renegade uh, um, citizens that were among that group that were, um, you know, doing too much, the much work. Okay. I would like to um, address your comment. Um, so it's one driver. So, so this is an ASL truck, the, the truck with the driver's by herself? It, it's the truck where it's the truck that, you, the it, it has two steering wheels. Right. This is, so it's an automated front-loaded truck because she's by herself. She's by herself. And so uh, in the cul-de-sac, she gets it because it's, it's a very long truck. So instead of her parking the truck, getting out, bringing the carts to, she's trying to basically go in there and service it. She, with the she must okay. have backed up. It was Unbelievable. She okay. went everywhere. All right. All right. And so it, we will address that um, Monday morning. I mean, I've definitely followed. So I know what lot it is because um, I know this side of town. So um, I don't know the, the driver, but before I leave, I definitely would get your address just to make sure that a general foreman is out there. Um, could be the wrong size truck that we're bringing into that cul de sac also. Because what we want to do is we want a right size truck. We want to make sure the truck is the right size that can get in and out with servicing all the residents. So I will definitely follow up with you um, before I leave. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. My name is Charles, Charles Phillips. I'm with the uh, Shadow Rock Lakes uh, Subdivision Association. One of the questions I have is re regarding sanitation. On your side loader trucks, do they, can they or will they take 
the back loading cans, trash cans. We still have our back loading trash can and we also have the larger side loading. So the only one they take is the, I mean, the, yeah, the side loading. The only one they take is the larger side loading. They do not take the back loading. I want to be sure I understand. So there's... We have two size cans. We have a smaller can, which was replaced by, the smaller can was the back loading can. You have a 65, you still have a 65 gallon, the original, Original. Roll cart. The original roll cart years ago used to be 65 gallon. And that was back loading, where they put, took it to the back and it loaded from the back. Now they have the side loading, which is a larger can. So just for clarification, the trucks can service any size can, rather it's a rear loader or the automatic side loader. So the rear loader is the ones with the two collectors on the back. We call those rear loaders. Right. The automated side loader is the arm that goes out and grab it. Right. It in the side. The, the collector can pick up, because we roll the carts. We roll it to the rear loader. It could be a 65 or a 95. Or the automatic side loader, that arm could pick up a 65 or a 95. So you're telling me your household has two roll carts, is what you're saying? Yes. So you have two roll carts, so I'm assuming you're paying the higher assessment fee for two roll carts. They delivered, at first they delivered the smaller roll okay, cart. Okay, so we didn't come back and pick back up. You didn't come car. back and pick up the other one. So we got two roll carts. <laughs> Not only do we have it, but half the neighborhood is like that. So what happened is we should have come back and picked back up those 65 gallons. And you did not. Okay. So if we can we use them? To have two roll carts is the additional charge. Your sanitation assessment fee includes the 195 gallon. The excess garbage to have the two roll carts, that is a additional fee. So sanitation, our contractor, our contractor, it was a swap out program. And it wasn't a perfect program. Right. So the swap out program, we should have come back in there, the contractor should have came in there and picked up the 65 gallon. Because the 95 gallon give all the residents an additional 30 gallon capacity. So the contractor failed to come back in there and pick it up, and so sanitation should have, at some point, came back and picked up all those 65 gallon roll carts from those homes. And they, they did not. They did not. Got so it. as a result, I guess some of the our neighbors, are the old flow, they use them both. Right, and probably, probably both roll carts probably not used every week. It's probably used on an as-needed basis. Yes. Yes. Yeah, each house should have one 95-gallon roll cart, and, and the recycling program is optional. But to answer your question, the trucks can pick up any size cart. Okay, one final question. What happens with the one that we have that we cannot use, that they will not pick up? Will they come back and get it? And the reason why I'm asking that question is because in our association, all right, part of our sanitation should be hidden, if I'm making myself clear. Yes. So it should be hidden, but if you got all of these carts, where a lot of cases it's difficult to hide them so, the, so they're set on the side of the home or in the front or whatever. Is there, and if they're not being used, will you come back and get those cards. Oh, yes, yes. we should have, we, we should have, with you identifying it, and that's another thing about HOAs, um, you know, they want them out at a certain time and they want them back at a certain time. So having right. that one card is also helpful also because you're not trying to store multiple cards. Right. So that's why I said that if the, we hired a contractor, the contractor failed to come in there, pick back up those 65 gallons. We need to come back up and pick up those 65 gallons just to make everybody the same. Everybody should have one 95 gallon roll cart. Okay. Okay. But I would definitely um, follow up with you, uh, sir, for sure, before I I leave to make sure I got the your either area or your subdivision um, identified. Thank you. No problem.
This is my first time hearing about there being two charges. Like if you have two of the cars, can you tell me what the amounts are for having the one versus the two? Sure, it's been that way for the past 18 years that I've been here in the county. Um, so if the standard cart used to be 65 gallons, if you had an additional 65 gallon, you pay 300, your, your rate is $265 a year. Mm -hmm. If you had 265, I'm speaking of years ago, then you pay $350 per, for the year. It was additional $85 per cart. Now that you have the 95 gallon carts, every, just about all residents pretty much have a 95 gallon cart now. Two ninety-five gallons. Your annual assessment fee is four hundred eight dollars a year. And how much are they charging if you decide to drop, go to the the landfill, and you wanna you wanna um, throw some things out? Is this still the same charge, or did the they land, go up? The minimum charge at the landfill now is sixteen dollars and fifty cents. Oh, okay. So if you if, so if you transport it to the landfill, it goes up to nine hundred and ninety nine pounds, and you you pay sixteen dollars and fifty cents. Now, if you're taking recycling to the landfill, it's no charge. But if you take in garbage to the landfill, the minimum charge is sixteen dollars and fifty cents. But the multiple carts have always been charged out there. It's, it's, it's always been there. It's on the sanitation website. Um, it's, like I said, for the, for the 18 years that I've been there, we've always charged for multiple carts. Recycling was introduced in the former uh, CEO commission, I mean, administration that was under Vernon Jones administration when we had the 18 gallon bins. And then uh, we introduced, it was too much work for us to pick those bins up and bags up. We were just not very effective. So then we went to the roll carts to be apples to apples with the trash cans. But then we also realized that the 65 gallon size was not what we call right sizing for, the res for a typical resident's home. So then we, in we increased that size to 95 gallons to give the resident an additional 30 gallon capacity because we're there every week. And if we're not there weekly, Trust me, residents will pick up the phone and call or send emails, and we would go back out there and get it. The typical household, when you look, if you are a recycling, your garbage should be reduced by 20 or 25% per week if you're a true recycler. Your recycling sometimes can be more than your garbage. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Just for timekeeping, we are about eight minutes remaining for questions and answers. Uh, thank you so much for allowing this um, type of presentation to happen. I'm a new, new, newly resident of the DeKalb area, having spent um, quite a bit of my time in Fayetteville, if, uh, if you will. I just wanted to recognize the presenters today, and thank you so much for the information uh, in reference to the. <laughs> Uh, the mobile health clinics uh, and some of the other information that is for community. I just wanted to raise the question since we have the appropriate players in the room, given the fact that the federal government, I would say, and sort of the nation is focusing on equity, health equity, as well as social determinants of health. How are we spending resources to innovate? So I heard that we have openings, uh, if you will. How are we maybe redefining some of our young folks or individuals who may have gone astray in certain criminal to maybe help them get job skills to maybe help necessitate that, that help to fill that role as well as I heard probation because I know that's a financial probation. So all of that, how are we working together to sort of address the needs and making sure that uh, we have appropriate um, medical services, preventive services, knowing that some of the hospitals and things of that nature are closed. So it's just a philosophical question since Seems like we have local government and state in the room. Thank you. Do we have anyone who if wants to jump in? You want us to address the commissioner? 
Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Um, at the DeKalb County Board of Health, we're definitely beginning to focus as we transition from uh, focusing on 100 or leading with our COVID effort to transitioning for more services. We are definitely looking at health equity as well as the social determinants of health. In our department, we have a, a health equity coordinator that is going into the community, attempting to understand what the community needs are. Um, we're actually implementing a survey so we can gather the data to start determining what's the best way to approach the needs within the community. As it relates to social determinants of health, as we deploy our mobile units in the community, we're also, as I previously indicated, collaborating with community partners. Within that, we're hoping to include additional services as we have our mobile units into the community. And that's one of our first steps in addressing health equity as well as looking at uh, overall comprehensive approach to address the needs within the community. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lemi, and I have a question for the Code Enforcement uh, Office. Um, based on my own experience in the area where I live, I live in a very, very beautiful area, but we, we do have a few uh, residents who doesn't acknowledge in keeping the area clean. And for the past three years, there have been many of us who've made numerous amount of reports, um, upload the information that is required, and we still have problem with, within the area. So my, my question is, what, what do you really have in place for accountability when we are constantly making reports, making the phone calls to keep our neighborhood clean, and we seem to be having a hard time doing so? And um, if you check your report, you, you, I'm, I'm sure you'll, you'll see a lot, a lot of people that have, have been making the reports that is required, but we're still having a lot of problem. Um, one example, we have one house in my neighborhood. Neighborhood is a very beautiful area. One house in my neighborhood, we've been, we've been working with it for three years. It, it doesn't make any sense. And I'm constantly speaking to the neighbors and say, what happened? What's going on here? One of the neighbors says, because we don't have any um, politician who live in the area. So we, we, we seem to be having a hard time getting things done. It really shouldn't be that way. So what are accountabilities that you have in place to get things done, to get our neighborhood clean? Thank you. Um, thank you for your um, for the information, sir. First of all, I, I need to know the exact area so I can kind of figure out uh, how we deployed our staff there, and uh, you know who's primarily responsible for this specific area. Uh, I have some forms outside, and I'm happy to meet with you afterwards so we can drill down to exactly you know um, the location you're talking about, and I may be able to give you an update as to where we are in the enforcement process. Sometimes. It's, it's a long process because we depend on a lot of different uh, uh, agencies as we go through the enforcement action. But, but I'm happy to figure out exactly where you're talking about and at least give you a status report. And then if I can't give you a status report today, then I'll follow up with you via email uh, during the course of the week. Do you have one more? Oh. Sorry. Uh, good morning. My name is Laxton Thomas. I live in the uh, Eminence Wood neighborhood subdivision of townhouses. Um, uh, this place is, uh, I guess, about 30, 40, I think, um, built in, in the early 80s. Anyway, our neighborhood, I guess you could say, been going down uh, kind of, uh, I thought, a low priority. Neighborhood Kroger, and Kroger left, and then um, after the pandemic, you know, we're struggling and we lost our HOA. 
and um, and um, there was some dumping in our neighborhood, some serious dumping, and it wasn't the residents doing it. The uh, sanitation would come out and pick it up. They did that over months, several pickups, large pickups, and um, we did, and they were dumb. You couldn't catch them. You couldn't. They would do it overnight. Large dumpage. And uh, I want to say this. Um, we called Commissioner Bradshaw's office, and uh, he got with sanitation. And it's amazing how they resolved that problem. They absolutely did a good job, and I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. What a wonderful last comment as we wrap up um, our Q&A. Okay. okay. Yes, so I'm going to let you come up and give some thanks, Commissioner Bradshaw. Would that be fine? Okay. okay. All right. Well, we are at our appointed end time. I think our uh, department heads are going to stick around. If anybody wants to do a one-on-one -on -one and get your problems resolved, that's why we bring them together, bring them to you to do that. But I'm once again grateful to everybody for being here, especially grateful to our guests uh, from Big Brothers Big Sisters. Looking forward to our our high-powered partnership over the next uh, several weeks and months and all of my friends who are here who are stepping up to support us in this process. I see my good buddy Al Edwards there. That's a guy y'all should know. Already acknowledged the pastor, Patrick Medley. Uh, start calling names, I'm going to get in trouble. So, uh, But I'm, I'm very grateful for your presence. And uh, we will do this again in about, a month, about three months. It's quarterly in the fourth, so we'll do it once a quarter uh, in purpose as long as y'all keep electing me. So uh, I thank you so much. Y'all have a great, safe rest of your Saturday and a great rest of your weekend. Okay.